written by Sri Sanjay Parikshar, Senior Advocate and Executive Council Member, Indian Society of International Law. I would like to welcome all the distinguished guests sitting on the dais and off the dais. It is an honor to welcome Honorable Mr. Justice T. H. Narasimha Shah, Judge Supreme Court of India. We welcome you, sir, to be here with us today to deliver the lecture. Unfortunately, Sri Pravinash Parikh Sir, President Indian Society of International Law, he could not be present on the occasion due to certain family circumstances. He has conveyed his sincere gratitude to Honorable Mr. Justice Narasimha Sir and appreciation to Sri Sanjay Parikh Sir for his book. I would also like to welcome Professor Manoj Kumar Srinath, Vice President Indian Society of International Law and Director Indian Law Institute. Professor Deepi Hegde Sir, Chairperson Center for International Legal Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and EP Member, Indian Society of International Law. Sri Sanjay Parikh Sir, Senior Advocate and Executive Council Member, Indian Society of International Law, and Dr. Shikhar Ranjan, Secretary General, Indian Society of International Law. I would like to invite all the guests present on the dais and family members of late Justice Rajinder Satsaji to pay homage to late Raj Justice Rajinder Satsaji by offering flowers with folded hands. Thank you so much. Uh, before we begin with the addresses uh, by the distinguished guests present here, I on behalf of the society would take this opportunity to invite again the members, family members of Justice Rajinder Satsaji to kindly present token of appreciation to our guest, Honorable Mr. Justice T. S. Narasimha Sir. I request you to please be on the stage, sir. Now, I would also like uh, to invite I request uh, Professor Manoj Kumar Sina sir to felicitate uh, sir with the token of gratitude. Thank you so much sir. Now I request Professor VP Hegde sir to present token of appreciation to Sri Sanjay Parikh sir on the occasion of release of his book. Thank you so much. Now I request Professor Vijay Hegde sir to kindly address the gathering with his welcome speech and also introductory remarks about the book Force and Hunger authored by Sri Sanjay Parikh sir. Uh, good evening to everybody. 
thank you very much for inviting me to uh, provide a short welcome address and also about the book. Uh, first, uh, uh, today we are gathered here to uh, listen to the second Justice Rajinder Prachar Memorial Lecture by Honorable Mr. Justice T. S. Narsimha on right on the right to food security. And also we have the small program to release the book by Sri Sanjay Parekh, our colleague here, on the subject Courts and Hunger. So let me first of all welcome Honorable Mr. Justice T. S. Narsimha Narsimha, who is here to give us the uh, address on right to food security, sir, on behalf of the Indian Society of International Law, on my behalf, I cordially welcome you, sir, for this function. I will also uh, welcome uh, our Vice President, uh, Mr. Manoj Kumar Sina, who is going to chair the meeting today, and then we have with us uh, Sri Sanjay Parekhji, his book is Courts and Hunger will be released today and I am going to speak for two minutes about the book and then I also welcome and, uh, and uh, uh, welcome the family members of the uh, Sri Justice Rajendra Sacharji today here and all the other uh, colleagues and guests who are actually attending the meeting and also the EC members uh, also who are present here uh, to attend the meeting. So with this small welcome address, let me say a few things about the book. It's going to be very short. So I thought it's uh, uh, the book, Courts and Hunger by Sri Sanjay Parekh, Senior Advocate Supreme Court. This book is published by Wani Book Company. It is unique in many ways. The book perhaps might not have been written by Sanjay Ji, but for his passion and something more to deal with this issue before the Honorable Supreme Court and later mostly at the National Human Rights Commission. As the book title says, it is about understanding the man-made disaster at Kalahandi, Balangir, Koraput, which are known as KBK districts in Odisha. Now, now these districts have been again uh, in this book very great in great detail he has given. Uh, these three districts now have been distributed into more than eight districts now. They have been expanded. Uh, according to the statistics given by the book, almost 30% uh, of the land mass of Odisha is in this district. Plus, it also has 19.8% uh, of the population living in this area. These are well known. Kalahandi is well known, but they are known as KBK districts for whatever reason, whatever what has happened in the last several decades there. We all respond with a lot of concern to the subjects like poverty, hunger, malnutrition, unorganized labor and so on. But here in this book, one can see that the aspect of hunger figures a chord in the author. Just not that. It makes Sanjayji do something about it. In the introductory part, Sanjayji explains beautifully and simply about an incident that he saw as a child that made him think about the aspects of hunger. Well, I do not want to narrate that story here now. It is for all of you to read. It's there in the book. Or maybe he can tell you later. This part also narrates the context that emerged in the years to come deal with this issue. His first meeting with Mr. Kishan Patnaik, the member of parliament and a social activist from Odisha around 19, in 1989, who took this issue to the Supreme Court and argued in person. The court had issued proper orders and had given liberty to Mr. Patnaik to come back uh, whenever he wanted, actually. And one word about uh, Mr. Kishan Patnaik, because it's, again, personal to me, most importantly for me. He was an alumnus of JNU as well, and he was quite senior to me. But uh, uh, I know generations of uh, my uh, senior friends and other colleagues, activists, were inspired by Kishan Patnaik to work in the rural areas, many, many of whom I have personally known. And uh, uh, somebody, some people worked in Madhya Pradesh, some have worked in Odisha, Bihar, and many places. And I don't think Kishan Patnaik is no more. At that time, he was very unwell. 
uh, when he met uh, Sanjay ji that much I know and he was also responsible in the starting he was very active in JNU um, they had what is called as Samsa Yujan Sabha that point of time I can because I was student at that point of time in JNU now of course I am teaching there so this is my personal anecdote to share with you and he, he was one of the legends uh, in that sense who worked tirelessly and brought this uh, Kalhandi KBK district to the fore, to the court and uh, he was dedicated to that, that much uh, of course all of us know. But later of course it's Sanjay ji who took it over. Uh, when um, he, Sanjay ji met him in 1989 and which of course is in the book, I am not saying anything out of the book but only this earlier part which I mentioned is of course out of the book. However, he could not further fight the case, Kishan Patnaik just told him. As Sanjay ji puts it, I just want to quote, when I met him again, he looked disheartened and said that it would not be possible for him to start the battle all over again. I expressed my wish to take it forward to see it to its logical end. This is what Sanjay ji told him and of course he did. I think I should give an applause for this great uh, thing. The story of this book is just that. Concisely published, this book of about 200 pages has about 10 chapters of varied length. First few chapters provide the history and profiles of the uh, KBK district, Kalahandi, Bolangnar, and then uh, the, uh, the Koraput district. It gives the story for almost 100 years uh, with statistics, with details. Uh, what are the, uh, how actually, who actually are the people living there and all those details. The chapter on the history of famine court, famine, famine court, there are famine courts developed by British that time, provides us an interesting insight as to how the British and later the independent Indian government, government of India dealt with the issue of famine. Uh, it records in detail the approach and the SOPs to the followed by the successive administration, uh, which is quite uh, interesting to see. And of course, this was studied by many people uh, uh, later. How these famine courts by themselves became a problem at a later stage is what Sanjay ji explained. He also refers to various writings and sources such as Professor Amartya Sen, Professor Zin Graves, and several others who worked on this issue. There are many in uh, India. Uh, not only economists, others who have been working continuously on this issue. That's what I think we should take into account. Which Sanjay ji, of course, has his uh, has references to this in his book. There is a separate chapter on international law and human rights and right to adequate food. This is followed by constitution and the right, right to food. Let later parts of the book deal with the proceedings before the Supreme Court and the National Human Rights Commission. Statistical details, tables and references add to the authenticity of the book. It ends with a chapter on the road ahead and the continued monitoring mechanism. All the primary documents that include court proceedings and proceedings before the NHRC have been annexed to the book as seven appendices. So, it's a, so this will be very useful for the, as a basic source for further research for its students and lawyers and others. It was indeed a long battle of over a decade for Sanjay ji and others, including Rajendra Satyarji. I think I, I have seen the appendices where uh, Rajendra Satyarji, I think, appeared along with him in the initial stages before the Supreme Court. So I think it is a very fitting tribute to Satyarji, uh, you know, this book as well, actually, because he was one of the uh, active members of the PUCL and and they actually work together uh, on this case as well. This will be a very basic, uh, it was a long battle, so there is indeed no end to this battle. It started around after Kishan Patnaik ji left, Sanjay ji and other, uh, you know, agencies including PUCL took it over and it was a long battle of over a decade for them. Generally first they went to Supreme Court and then it was, uh, it went to the Honorable Supreme Court directed it to National Human Rights Commission to look at it. And uh, there are people who have worked as special rapporteurs. He mentioned the re references he made to Mr. Chaman Lal and there are other people who actually went there and worked uh, with on the ground 
to see the problem there and how to improve it actually problem is one thing but how to actually take care of what kind of changes are required that's what actually the court and hrc particularly looked at it so i'll just take another minute and finish there is indeed no end to this battle but it is heartening to see that the situation in kbk district improved considerably after 10 years of uh, this battle not only in legal battle but also on the ground to improve the situation measures taken and odisha government also was very helpful in doing it i i just this is my view point this uh, the role of the what actually i can see from the book is the role of the both the institutions in dealing with the issue over a long period of time in a complementary way is a study by itself of our great institutional framework both supreme court and the national human rights commission perhaps this is a someone should consider taking this forward looking at these issues uh, actually the nhrc uh, was that time uh, had mn venkatach justice mn venkatachalaya followed by justice uh, ds verma and then followed by uh, anand anand i think three uh, very distinguished chief justices of our country actually monitored this and all the records have been mentioned in the book it's very touching to see how actually they uh, talked about this is a primary sort of sources so the uh, perhaps someone should consider yeah so lastly the book has touching forward by honorable justice mn venkatachalaya it has a forward by him uh, whom i also knew and had a uh, great sort of a contact i mean i i knew him also personally well so i i can understand the way he wrote and we captures the content of the book in one sentence i just quote narration of history of the reformative action initiated in the kbk district by supreme court with the assistance of nhrc and his own significant role these are the three things which uh, justice venkatachalaya knows that this book actually contains and i also must mention that he requested the court and also the nhrc i remember sanjay ji himself wanted to go there on his own expense to study the problem and i think he did that actually because he didn't write much about it i think he should write more about these uh, things uh, one uh, one part about the book i should say that he has written only the in the first few pages about some personal account about the book but rest of it is more factual more uh, informative and more about the nhrc supreme court etc but i would rather want uh, sanjay ji to write about more about the personal account as to what he felt about it i'm sure sanjay ji himself is a poet he has written three volumes of poetry published by vani book company i can see in the back side of the book hopefully the next book should tell us more about the uh, more not, not about the Uh, about how he actually managed to do this for 10 to 15 years this will be very important for law school students who are actually studying uh, law in law universities because this is where i think uh, our future lies students should read this kind of studies to understand this there is something more than what actually they are doing to the world so that's what actually that's why i want him to write more about uh, the not only about the procedures beyond procedures what he can actually talk about which he did in the initial chapter this is the only discontent i have and i i wish he can only uh, resolve it only by writing another book perhaps and he should do it and lastly uh, there are many such stories of course uh, supreme court of course uh, we have honorable justice narsimha here supreme court i am sure has done not just i think we have monitored several cases i'm It's a great institution. They have really sustained uh, our access to justice issues. This is a very important access to justice issue. KBK district, the people there, they have no access, they have no idea, but they have been, uh, you know, part of our country. But the court, Supreme Court, and the NHRC effectively 10, 15 years have transformed the district up to a point with the help of the government, and it is possible. That is what. actually it's a very positive story that i must say so we have a book here where i just end by just uh, quoting from the uh, 
Sri uh, Justice, the Honorable Justice M. N. Venkatachala has forwarded the last word. Uh, I mean, the, after that, of course, never, never, so I quoted it. But Sanjay ji has a chapter on way forward. Of course, I will I will end by quoting his, uh, you know, words. One is he feels that this is need to be told. That one. Second, he suggests that this is a model that is workable. That you can go to court and concludes that in this in contemporary world. I mean, right now. The model which was adopted in the last, I mean, the way they went about transforming this KBK uh, district through various court orders, various uh, NHRC studies, etc., which Odisha government implemented. That statistics are available. So, having looked at that, he feels that in the contem contemporary times, whether it is the problem of migrant workers or the shortage of medicines during the COVID pandemic, a structured approach. Which is transparent and fixes accountability with periodical checks can, to a large extent, control the situation. So this is what I mean. There are of course many other things, but I think this is the crux. You have a model; you can actually work it out, and then uh, this can be uh, taken forward. I think the book has these uh, ideas, which is an extremely uh, important contribution, and title itself is a very unique in that sense: "Court and Hunger." We have so many books written on uh, the court and on many things. We, of course, we mostly look at uh, uh, more profitable avenues. But here is one book which actually, from the legal community, provides an insight into something extremely useful, interesting, but most importantly to the people. I think with these few words, I uh, introduce the book. Once again, welcome all the distinguished uh, uh, dignitaries. In Particularly, Justice Narsimha for this program, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your introductory remarks and for sharing the brief synopsis of the book. Now, I invite Professor Manoj Kumar Sinha, sir, to kindly give his comments on the book. Honorable Mr. Justice P. S. Narsimha, sir. जब सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑफ इंडिया श्री संजय पाड़ी सीनियर एडवोकेट सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑफ इंडिया प्रोफेसर वी जी एगडे प्रोफेसर ऑफ लॉ एंड चेयरपर्सन ऑफ सेंटर ऑफ इंटरनेशनल लीगल स्टडीज श्री शिखर डॉक्टर शिखर रंजन सेक्रेटरी जनरल ऑफ इंडियन सोसाइटी ऑफ इंटरनेशनल लॉ प्रोफेसर जौहर एंड ऑल डिग्नेटरीज ऑफ दी गायक एंड ऑफकोर्स दी फैमिली मेम्बर्स ऑफ रेस्पेक्टेड जस्टिस राजेंद्र सचर सर जी Now, like you know, if I go by the, the like you know, the, the issue which I have to speak, like you no, know, Hector has to speak remarks about the book and comments on the book. So comments, I'm little bit confused what comment I have to do. But let me start with the uh, sir very nicely elaborated about the book, how book has come. But uh, I must take a credit from Sanjay sir. The thought about the book, I believe, some way. रोटी पर चर्चा करते करते हमने कई बार इस बात पर कही थी आपसे जो हमारे सर के घर पे खाते खाते मैंने बहुत रोटियां सर के यहाँ तोड़ी हैं और सर के कितने रातें गुजारे हैं और ये सारे बुक्स को मैंने पर्सनली हाथ से ऊपर में हॉट सर के घर पे जाके सर के घर पे बैठ के और लिखा और आई एम वेरी हैप्पी डॉक्टर टोल्ड मी कि सम ऑफ योर नोट्स आर स्टिल बेयर विच यू हैव नोटेड डाउन सो आई गॉन थ्रू ऑल दीज थिंग्स एंड जस्ट आई रिटर्न फ्रॉम इंग्लैंड आई रियलाइज the importance of economic social and cultural rights the importance of economic social and cultural rights were never recognized the way civil and political rights have been focused and that is an unfortunate development it took place in the constitution and this and that also took place at the international level i'll come back to those parts little bit later usse pehle kuch cheeze hoti jo hamari zindagi mein bade hi aur hum log ka aisa swabhag raha hai so i feel very blessed कि वी हैव सीन पॉवर्टी फ्रॉम दी क्लोजनेस गरीबी को एहसास किया भुखमरी को देखा है और कई बार ऐसी महसूस करते हुए लगता है अपनी भी और दूसरों को भी जब यू वंस यू फील देन यू स्टार्ट रियलाइजिंग एंड दिस इज द रिफ्लेक्शन विच संजय पारी विच ही विटनेस ए गर्ल हुज वॉज लाइक सर्चिंग फॉर सम फूड एंड आउट साइड ऑफ द गार्डन एंड देन सब्सिक्वेंटली ही मेड सो दैट इज द रीजन दिस रिफ्लेक्शन एंड दिस हैज कम इन अ फॉर्म ऑफ बुक 
तो जब आप इस चीज़ों से गुजरते हैं और इस चीज़ों का अनुभव करते हैं तब आपको पता लगता है कि संविधान एक तरफ सुप्रीम कोर्ट के जजमेंट एक तरफ और एक ग्राउंड रियलिटी एक तरफ होती है तो यू फील कि वट आर दी चैलेंजेस आपको सामना करना है और किस तरह से इम्प्लीमेंटेशन करनी है वी आर वेरी फॉर्चुनेट वी कैन गो बैक एंड सी दैट स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम दी जजमेंट ऑफ दी आई थिंक लॉर्डशिप चंपतम दोराजम वर्सेज द स्टेट ऑफ मद्रास वर्स सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑफ इंडिया है पार्ट फोर हैज टू रन सब्सिडरी फंडामेंटल राइट अपोज द सब्सिक्वेंटली एम एच कुरेशी कोलकनाथ वामन राव एंड अदर हारमोनियस कंट्री कंस्ट्रक्शन इंटीग्रेटेड अप्रोच हैज बिन एंड इवन इन टिपू स्वामी जजमेंट किस तरह हैज साइटेड दैट रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन सिविल एंड पॉलिटिकल राइट एंड इकोनॉमिक सोशल एंड कल्चरल राइट अंडर पैराग्राफ टू सिक्सटी टू यू हैव मैंशन इन योर बुक ऑल्सो सो वी सी द कोर्ट ओवर द ईयर हैव ऑल्सो लुक इन टू and uh, when you look deeply under the article 37 of the indian constitution it has three important elements it says the first is a non justiciable second it says fundamental in governance in the country and third it talks about the state shall may, should make a law for the implementation so some way implementation is very much there but lack of resources lack of programming it has been made non justiciable and its implementation requires program policy and resources that is big consideration and that is the reason it has been in part four but if i compare the development which has also taken place at the global level at the global level the same time where our constitution was in the process of completion or drafting the same time another milestone at the global level which has taken place the adoption of universal declaration of human rights an universal declaration of human rights as an instrument which contains civil and political rights or what we can say part 3 of the indian constitution part 4 of the indian constitution and part 4a of the constitution only in 30 articles 30 articles under this universal declaration of human rights you see when they drafted including india participated in the drafting of universal Dec- declaration of human rights and hansa mehta was representative he was representing india uh there was no opposition because the members and also state thought about it's going to be a non legal binding instrument that was the universal declaration of human rights but the moment they moved to the second stage drafting of legal binding instrument and that has created lot of issues to which right should be given priority which right should be given priority like fundamental right right to life liberty equality all these or right to food right to housing right to clothes right to social security all these aspects unfortunately international level also it has been bifurcated and lot of you will be surprised to know then when we adopted international covenant and economic social and cultural rights in 1966 it did not have an effective implementation mechanism they said you know no state should complain no individual should file complaint so it was made renderless without enforcement mechanism which was filled in 2008 after like you no know, number of years on the 60 years of the adoption of uh, adoption of the universal declaration of human rights now there is a uh, mechanism there enforcement body is there for the enforcement of economic social and cultural rights why i am saying all these things because this book contains this part one of the chapters like uh, sri sanjay parikh had mentioned and that there he discussed about the uh, human rights in the international perspective sir broadly in his book has covered let me just quickly i think lot we all are here to hear the lot see so i will not go on teacher has a problem lot see to agar hum unko mic dete hain to wo mic ke piche is tarah se padte hain कि बच्चे चले जाए वो छोड़ते नहीं लॉट सो आई एम जस्ट लाइक बी वेरी ब्रीफ एंड क्विकली फिनिश बट आई जस्ट समराइज क्विकली बाय सेइंग फ्यू वर्ड्स जैसे इसमें कहा गया सर ने एक प्रोफाइल ऑफ केडीके डिस्ट्रिक्ट ही हैज गिवन एज हिट दिस सर पॉवर्टी एंड फेमिन कोर्ट के बारे में डिस्कस किए हैं हिस्ट्री ऑफ फेमेंस के बारे में डिस्कस किए हैं और इंटरनेशनल लॉ एंड कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल लॉ परस्पेक्टिव ऑल्सो सर हैज डिस्कस एंड सर हैज ऑल्सो highlighted many of the important supreme court judgment in this particular book so book is a in a beginning i'll not say and this we have to avoid lot of with all due respect i feel as a law student or law teachers and even we see everything in only one angle 
कानून के हिसाब से देखते लॉ के हिसाब से बट इट बिलोंग्स टू एवरी वन दिस बुक इज नॉट ओनली फॉर द लॉ स्टूडेंट इट बिलोंग्स टू द हिस्ट्री स्टूडेंट इट बिलोंग्स टू द सोशियोलॉजी स्टूडेंट इट बिलोंग्स टू ए कॉमन मैन आम आदमी भी इसमें पढ़ के अपने बारे में कुछ जानकारी हासिल कर सकता है सो सब्जेक्ट इज नॉट मोनोपलाइज बाय वन पर्टिकुलर स्ट्रीम बिकॉज इट हैज बीन रिटर्न बाय अ लॉयर और इट हैज बीन रिटर्न बाय रीटर सो द बुक विच हैज बीन रिटर्न बाय अ लॉयर इट शुड बी रेड एंड मेड अवेलेबल टू ऑल and to understand what is the content because the language which is very easily i believe anyone can read anyone can understand and everyone has a duty everyone has a duty to see that if things happening bad they can also play important role uh, let me conclude with this uh, i believe that ki sir you took long time to bring this book when you started journey from 1997 and that has been culminated so even the process is little bit slow with the drafting of international treaties like you no know, we have failed to draft in united nation convention any convention on terrorism so this failure of international community has failed to draft a international convention on terrorism so till day and india has like in 2002 sponsored a draft but it's still international committee but i'm very happy that sir has ignored that development and in 2022 he brought a book on an occasion वह जस्टिस राजेंद्र सचर की मेमोरियल दिन में पूर्व तिथि के समय लाया गया है और मैं एक और लास्ट बात कहता हूँ जो सर से थोड़ी पर्सनल लेवल पे है रोटियाँ तो बहुत थोड़ी खाना भी बहुत खाया और वो उन समय खाया जाए उसमें अभाव होती थी मैं सिस्टर के पास रहता तो मेरे मुझे लगता है कुछ दिक्कतें होती थी सर ने मेरी मदद करते थे और मैं जो भी हूँ कहीं ना कहीं संजय जी का बहुत बड़ा योगदान है पर्सनली और इसको मैं एक्नोलेज करना चाहता हूँ मैं उन बातों को बहुत ही उन बातों को मैं याद करता हूँ जैसे सर होते थे और मिसेज भी भाभी जी भी होती थी तो उन्होंने काफ़ी मेरे मनोबल को बढ़ाया और महान उस दशा में जहाँ जॉब की सच थी सारी चीज़ को वो करने के और उसके बाद इन्होंने मुझे एक तरीके से प्रोजेक्ट किया जस्टिस राजेंद्र सचर जी के घर पर भी कि मनोज को ह्यूमन राइट्स की कुछ जानकारी है और सर हमेशा जब भी रहते थे तो फ़ोन करते थे मैडम आपको बताते हैं मैं कई बार अपने घर पर भी गया हूँ तो सर फोन करते थे मनोज वो कल मैटर लग रहा है चार पांच आर्टिकल निकालो कहीं से तो मैं जल्दी से खोजता था और दे देता था तो उससे मेरी एक इमेज बनती थी कि ये लड़का करते हैं मुझे बाद में पता नहीं मैं उस सर्किल में फंसा हुआ अच्छा करने से फंसते भी हो तो ये भी बात है लेकिन वो बहुत ही इंजॉयमेंट होती है और इनसे बातें सर के आपके बहुत 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 आभारी हूँ सर का भी और संजय जय का तो आई एम वेरी फॉर्चुनेट दैट आई शेयर माई थॉट इन प्रजेंस ऑफ ऑनरेबल जस्टिस नरसिम्हा सर and we all are looking forward to hearing thank you very much thank you so much sir for uh, giving your insightful address and sharing your experience uh, now i would like to mention here that uh, publisher of the book ms uh, aditi maheshwari executive director vani prakashan group she couldn't join the occasion uh, due to some personal reason but she has shared her speech in writing with us and uh, with the permission of all i would like to take this opportunity to read her comments and views on the book uh, with your permission sir thank you uh, honorable mr justice for ts narsimha judge supreme court of india sri pravin h pariji president isil professor manoj kumar sinha director indian law institute professor vidhi hegde chair person center for international and legal studies jnu Mr. Sanjay Parichi, Dr. Shikhar Ranjan, and all the dignitaries, I extend my greetings to all of you from Vani Prakashan. We from Vani Prakashan are extremely happy that the book *Force and Hunger* by Mr. Sanjay Parichi, senior advocate, is going to be released today. I apologize for not being able to attend today's function due to some personal reasons. Mr. Sanjay Parichi has argued several important public interest matters pertaining to human rights, civil liberties, and environment. which i am sure you all must be aware of i don't want to list them here he raised the chronic problem of starvation deaths in kdk region of odisha having eight districts both before the supreme court and the national human rights commission a legal battle which took nearly a decade in a simple and concise manner this journey has been brought out in the book it sheds a spotlight on the kdk region and the legal struggle with this man made disaster This book opens watersheds of information about the court proceedings that led to a historical change in this region of Odisha. We hope that the book is read by scholars, law practitioners and general readers too so that awareness about this struggle travels far and wide and that similar efforts are made by the state in the regions which are facing the human problems of deprivation, hunger and death. On this occasion, we are also thankful
thankful to Meda Patraji and Professor Yen Rui to have endorsed the exquisite research and tireless work of Sri Sanjay Parikh as his publisher of other books taking human rights forward people's union for civil civil liberties judgment and his poetry collection dhoop mein chhipe sab tum ho to hu and kuch na kaho is sand we at vani prakashan group are honored and equally amazed to learn about the humane side of sri pari as swami vivekananda said karma is the eternal assertion of human freedom we wish sri pari more strength in his pursuit of freedom for society and for the youth of forthcoming generation thank you thank you so much now i invite sri sanjay parik sir to address the gathering and to give introductory remarks on justice rajinder sachaji honorable justice ps narsimha judge supreme court of india professor v g hegde chairperson center for international legal studies jnu professor manoj kumar sinha director indian law institute dr shikhar anjan secretary general isl ki sanjeev sachcha madhvi sachcha members of the bar colleagues and friends my good friend professor ramanujan was provide chancellor of ignu is sitting here and i said whether whether i speak about the book after two speakers have introduced the book and he said don't speak too much because it has already been introduced so i will not actually talk about the book because we have assembled here for justice uh, sachar memory lecture the second one but i would like to say two things number one is i am touched by the sentiments which were expressed by professor manoj sinha and as he mentioned he acknowledged i also acknowledge that whatever i know about international law is because of him uh the book i only say was a dream <coughs> dream which i saw as a child and all of us have those dreams and we try to realize them when there is potentiality when there is something in you and there is an institution in which you are working to try to do something it may be a legal institution it may be educational institution it can be any other institution but realization of the, the dream if you have then i think the entire purpose of your being there becomes meaningful otherwise it will be an it becomes an exercise of acquiring information or earning money and that's all nothing more than that the other thing is that surprisingly there is another aspect which we must know that how the commitment happens when the commitment comes according to me is some concept of knowledge by identity that you identify yourself with the issue you put your entire self into it and once you put your entire self into it what a person sees actually with the physical eyes cannot do that which your your vision can really achieve that's another thing and we must understand all of us who work and take up the human causes public causes should have that in mind it's not the physical one which is important it is your internal life what you see uh, inside you which is important now i would not like to say uh, more things about the book because i have to uh, we have to proceed with the uh, justice sachar mam lecture so uh, as i am welcoming justice ps narsimha 
judge of the Supreme Court of India. I am grateful to him for readily agreeing to deliver this lecture and to release the book. In spite of his busy schedule, the first Rajinder Satyanayana lecture on human rights concerns and challenges was delivered by Justice Madan B. Lokur on 10th of December 2019 due to corona pandemic. The continuity of these lectures was disturbed. We hope to continue with these novel lectures regularly in the future. I thank ISL, its President Sri P.H. Parekh, who could not come today because of personal reasons. An office there is for the decision to include Justice Satchan on the lecture as a part of its regular annual event to recall Justice Satchan's immense contribution and commitment to the cause of human rights and civil liberties. The other annual event being V.K. Krishna Menon Memory Lecture for Sri Menon's contribution in the field of international law. Though this audience is familiar with immense contributions made by Justice Satchan, still I think it would be befitting the occasion to remember his work and to say a few words about him. Sri Satchar was born in Lahore, present day in Pakistan on 22nd December 1923. His entire education, including law, took place in Lahore. His father, Sri Dhimsen Satchar, a veteran freedom fighter, was the first Chief Minister of Punjab immediately after the first general elections took place in 1952. Later, he became governor of Andhra Pradesh and thereafter high commissioner for India to Sri Lanka. Sri Dhimsen Satchar suffered detention due to his strong opposition of emergency in 1975. Sri Rajmir Satchar had a successful career as an advocate in Punjab High Court. He was president of the High Court Bar Association from 1967 to 1968. He earned a great name and reputation as an advocate. Thereafter, he was appointed as judge of the Delhi High Court in 1970. Later, he was transferred to Sikkim as the first acting chief justice of Sikkim High Court after the High Court was set up there. He also served in the Rajasthan High Court for some time before he finally returned to Delhi High Court from where he retired as chief justice in December 1985. During his tenure, he headed one-man inquiry committee to inquire into the air crash in 1973, in which Mohan Kumar Mangalam, the then Union Minister for Steel, had died. In 1977, he chaired the High Powered Committee to review the Companies Act and the MRTP Act. The texts were amended, accepting his recommendations. In 1984, Sri Satchar reviewed working of the Industrial Disputes Act. Among other, other achievements was his being the member of UN Subcommission from 1990 to 1994 on the prevention of discrimination and protection of minorities. He also worked with the UN Commission on Human Rights on the right to adequate housing and had submitted a report on right to adequate housing at Geneva. He was the trustee of Servants of People's Society and Gandhi Smarak Nidhi. He actively practiced as a senior advocate in the Supreme Court from 1986 till 2017. Among several important cases we argued are the cases relating to mandatory declaration of assets and criminal antecedents by MPs and MLAs, none of the above nota option in elections, against surveillance and phone tapping, and against amendment in the Representation of People's Act, removing the domicile requirement in Rajya Sabha elections. He was closely associated with Dr. Ramon Lohia, Jay Prakash Naren, and Madhuli Me, among others from an early age. His attachment to People's Union for Civil Liberties, UCL, of which he was president from 1986 till 1995, was remarkable. He contributed a lot to strengthen the organization. I remember that in public functions, he always referred his recognition as being a member of UCL rather than as former Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court. He became popular when he submitted the report on social, economic and educational status of the Muslim community in India as chairperson of the high level committee. The report emphasized on the growing social and economic insecurity and disparity which Muslims face since independence. He was a regular contributor on all current social, political and legal issues. 
which regularly appeared in prominent newspapers. He passed away at the age of 94 on 20th April Max 2018. His sons and Jeev, daughters Madhvi and grandchildren survived him. My association with him after his retirement in 1986 for more than three decades is still vivid in my memory. Probably it was the best part of my professional career. We worked together on so many cases of public importance, traveled together as members of People's Commission to record the testimony of poor tribals and farmers on the operations and exploitation they suffered. We fought many crucial cases pertaining to electoral reforms and for protection and promotion of human and constitutional rights. This was not merely the association which enriched me in diverse ways, law being its small component, but in viewing the life differently. To think and observe one's relationship with the other, a selfless pursuit, a concern arising from within for those who suffer inequality, man-made or otherwise. I suppose the book Quotes and Hunger is the result of such a concern. I am ever grateful to him for what he, what I learned in his education. He was extremely humble and polite, but when occasions came to show his dissent, he was emphatic and strong. He was affectionate and sensitive in human relationships. His association was a blessing and an asset which I ever cherish and remember. In his autobiography, In Pursuit of Justice, Justice Sachar has narrated many stories and anecdotes. One incident is quite interesting. In 1955, when his father was Chief Minister of Punjab, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru was invited to have breakfast at their residence. Full of socialistic ideas and opposed to certain policy decisions of Pandit Nehru, Sri Sachar politely told his father he will not join them for breakfast. It thus ended in Sri Sachar not meeting one of the greatest leaders of India. He later felt that it was child childish, but called it as his youthful, genuine and unshakable faith in socialism, faith in social values, which he continued to have till the end. Another instance of his independent thinking was his taking up cases of human rights violation and illegal arrest against the government headed by his father as the chief minister. But credit also goes to his father, who appreciated his son for being sensitive towards such issues. In the book, he narrates another interesting incident. During emergency, both his father, that is to say, Sri Dinesh and Sacha, and his brother-in-law, well-known journalist Kuldeep Nair, were arrested. His father was initially taken to Tihar jail where Kuldeep Nair was already lodged. He thought that his father-in-law had come to take care of him to see whether he was all right, but got a shock when Sachaji's father affectionately told him, Beta, dear son, I have come to give you company. <laughs> As a judge of Delhi High Court, he took up many bold stands. One being, one such being questioning of all cases of attempt to commit suicide pending in different courts, most of the cases being against poor laborers. Later, Supreme Court affirmed the law. In public meetings where human rights issues were discussed, he was always in the forefront. People awaited for him, fondly called Sacharji by the masses, his absence a a vacuum, a void, is felt more by everyone in the present atmosphere. Late Sri Solis J. Sarabji rightly said, Justice Sachar's fight to preserve the secular fabric of India continued till the day he passed away. With this introduction of Justice Sachar, let me introduce to you this evening's speaker, Justice P.S. Narsimha, Judge Supreme Court of India. He was elevated directly from the bar on 31st August 2021, which is a rare recognition and honor. Born on 3rd May 1963 to Srimati Satyavati and late Justice P. Kotandar Ramaya in Hyderabad, he graduated with P. 
triple majors in economics, political science and public administration from Azam College, Hyderabad and pursued law at the Campus Law Center, Delhi, used in 1988. In the same year, he was enrolled as an advocate and practiced before the High Court, Civil Courts and Tribunals in Hyderabad. He later shifted his practice to the Supreme Court and appeared in a large number of cases, including before the Constitution benches. He was designated as a senior advocate by the Supreme Court in the year 2008. As a senior advocate, he appeared in many public law cases involving constitutional, administrative, and environmental issues. He specialized in laws relating to telecom, competition, electricity, and other regulatory jurisdictions. He was a micus curia for the bench sharing forest matters. He was appointed as the Additional Solicitor General of India in 2014. In that capacity, he appeared in several landmark cases, including the NJAC case before the Constitution Bench. He also appeared in the Ayodhya title dispute matter. He was part of the Indian Supreme Court delegation to the Canadian Supreme Court, where he presented a paper on extradition and environment. He had the rare opportunity of leading the Indian team and represented India before the International Tribunal for the Law of Sea in Hamburg, Germany. He also represented India before the Permanent Court of Arbitration, Hague in Investment Treaty Arbitration. He is part of the governing body of National Legal Service Authority of India and closely associated with the Mediation and Conciliation Project Committee of the Supreme Court of India. As a law officer, he was instrumental in constituting and being part of the High Power Committee, suggesting sweeping changes to the Arbitration Act and, and proposing a mechanism for institutional arbitration. He was a member of committees relating to the restructuring of all appellate tribunals and reviewing the legal regime concerning corporate social responsibility. He has also been a member of the Investor Education and Protection Fund Authority. Supreme Court appointed him as a mediator in the DCCI case. He could successfully mediate between the members and the board for holding elections and the constitution of an elected body. He had been on the Executive Council of many national law universities and other educational institutions. He was elevated as a judge of the Supreme Court of India directly from the bar on 31st August 2021, which I mentioned earlier. He will take over as CGI for over six months from October 2027 to May 2028. I would like to share few words on today's topic. I will be brief. Poverty and hunger still prevail. Hunger causes poverty. Poverty induces hunger. It's a vicious circle. Humanity should be free from hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. It's a basic human right. But mindless acquisition of fertile lands, developmental activities eroding the fragile and meager resources of livelihood of the tribal and rural poor, resulting in destitution, unemployment, and hunger. Social and political systems allowing exploitation and rampant corruption, inhibiting access to food, are all factors which trigger hunger and food insecurity. Good governance and constitutional compassion in a democracy by all wings of the state can reduce these sufferings to a great extent. At least causes which are man-made can be redressed, which we saw actually in KBK, a district example which I have mentioned in the book. Sustainable development goals aim at creating a hunger-free world by 2030, a laudable and ambitious goal indeed. But climate change is a big threat which mankind is facing today. It is affecting water, land and environment. Excess heat, excess rain, drought and other phenomena are causing human displacement and breaking down the food systems. Food security is under grave threat. Is this disaster man-made? That's the question. The debate is, who should be blamed? Who should we blame? Rich countries, people living there, all of us, or those who control the power and decide on the choices we make. We have to decide it before it is too late. Survival of humanity itself is at stake. 
without elaborating much, I would end by saying that our Honorable Speaker will enlighten us in this crucial issue of great importance and relevance today. Thank you very much. I, uh, my, I should have actually, uh, in, in the beginning itself, should have paid my respect to Justice Raman Venkat Talaya, uh, because he was the presiding judge who structured the entire proceedings. I would like to also thank Sri Chaman Lalji, who was special rapporteur, who visited these places and gave very important suggestions. I must also thank uh, my colleagues who helped me, Mr. Nash Mishra, Sir Shanmugo Patro, Piyush Mohapatra, Minni Suzanne Thomas, Mon Shri Pathak, Sanjana Shri Kumar, Dr. Claude Alvarez, and Professor Manoj Sitiakhan. Aditi and Anuvashri who helped me, who are the publishers of this book. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your insights on uh, the contributions made by Justice Rajendra Satyaji. Now is the time to release a book titled Sports and Hunger, authored by Sri Sanjay Pai. I would request Honorable Mr. Justice T.S. Narasimha sir to kindly release the book and all the distinguished guests on the dais to join.
he reacts in the same way as Gandhiji does. And uh, there is nothing different from the way he would have acted. He points out one point of distinction, that is, when he saw something wrong, he stood up and did something. It's nothing unusual for most of us to see death or to see hungry people. But uh, the incident in Sanjay's uh, book, which he narrated, a hungry woman being there and uh, he saw her, created a kind of a sensation in him and he internalized it and carried it with him till date. And that is how that thing got translated into the book. It is the thought which matters and it is the will of the person, it's exclusively the will of the person that translates the thought into action. And I congratulate him for not only being sensitive like many others, but to take it forward and try and see a solution to it. I also uh, remember yet another incident when Gandhiji had gone to West Bengal for the first time and people insisted that he go and see Alibadi, the Mata temple there. And as he was about to enter, I believe he saw a large number of lepers there. And uh, he didn't even enter the temple. And he called for a bus, organized uh, for a space where they, he can start a shelter for them, and shifted all of them there. And that happens to be the India's largest shelter home for the lepers. This again is yet another incident where I am sharing with all of you that how the action that follows the thought which enters one's mind matters so much for change in the society to be brought about. The another reason which I was indicating is I remember Rajendra Prasadji, we used to be seeing him regularly in our Supreme Court canteen. A very cheerful man, extremely dignified man, and in his uh, Bandgala long sherwani. He was a firefighter in the court. He would come back, forget about everything, sit with friends, chat, have a cup of tea. Very courteous to youngsters. Uh, his picture is very vivid in my mind. And I am again grateful for inviting me to speak today on a topic which is so very important so relevant, so compelling and uh, which is perhaps the very purpose of our, of our constitutional governance. Without being, uh, the speech being in the form of a uh, lengthy narration of uh, case law and other things. I would want to share some thoughts with all of you. Uh, the story of Supreme Court, particularly in the context of hunger, is, I think, episodic. It is perhaps in two phases, and uh, I think the time has come for the Supreme Court to take it to the third phase in the context of right to hunger. The when we speak about hunger or right to food, we are talking about the need for food and not a want. And even that need is not being provided to all and that is a matter of concern. There are studies with respect to whether there is sufficient food or not. This is an issue of economics. There is enough number of articles which say that the world has sufficient food to feed everybody. But then it is a question of entitlement which troubles the way of distribution and 
the economic process marginalizes many number of people to become hungry and perish interesting part for us to consider today is the place that hunger or right to food in the constitution when we declare we the people solemnly resolve to provide for all of us equality liberty and fraternity there is no reference to a right created or an establishment or a solemn resolve to ensure that nobody goes hungry that's not the way the constitution is to be read when we say we the people it takes within its teeth the obligation not only of the state but also of the individual and also of the society and the members to ensure that a brother and a sister doesn't go hungry going beyond the con- preamble and to search where exactly is this right created we have in the directive principles that in endeavors of the state to ensure that there is equal equality in employment there is a right to work and the state shall endeavor that there are means by which somebody is empowered when we come to fundamental rights most important part of fundamental right yet again you would not see any right being created with respect to a person i think all that we have is right to life there is no doubt about this fact that right to life will definitely include the right to food nobody will even doubt that but then the first phase of the supreme court consideration of this very important issue arose in a series of judgments where it expanded this expression life and declared it that it shall also include the right to food there are a series of judgments i said that so i mean it's not necessary for us to recount recount all those but then the problem didn't stop there that declaration that there is a right of an individual under our constitution to have a food being provided to him to her did not really help the situation because that right even after recognition merely became a declaratory a right by itself would not have provided a midday meal to a person so the first phase was rather a recognition and declaratory in nature so one had to proceed further and the phase 2 came when the court realized that it is not sufficient here and unless we put in some kind of an obligation on the state the declaration itself will not be sufficient it is in the second phase that cases such as pucl where the court not merely recognized the right but also recognized an obligation of a state to ensure that hunger death won't occur or that food is provided to individual this happened in a couple of cases and sporadically there are some more instances which we don't need to recount today one or two cases were followed up over a period of time as they invented yet another methodology of continuous mandamus and ensured that the state would go on and on and finally come back and report to the court that it has been accomplished the question today for us is uh, is this sufficient enough even that additional step in the second phase has not solved the problem and it is at this stage that we need to recount yet another situation that is 
it's not merely in law it's not merely an issue of law it is a combination of economics and legal principles which would determine the position of a person who needs to be catered to a person who is hungry his rights and his entitlement the economic aspect of it has been researched enormously large number of factors got contributed to the situation where the world is today it is now more or less clear that it is not a production issue production of the food grain it is the distribution of the food today it's uh, you don't go very so very jurisprudentially or theoretically issues such as distribution of food grain across the country the procurement policies the pilferages the corruption and food the wastage lack of efficiency and many other such issues have been talked about discussed are economic issues which contribute to this unfortunate situation of many of our brethren going hungry today we may we will have to discuss another issue which is currently contributing to the problem and that relates to the legal issue and we can discuss that in two parts one is about entitlement which has trappings of legal aspects of it and apart from entitlement it is also the duty orientation constitution of a constitution in particular is primarily a right based primarily it prevents the state from encroaching the most precious fundamental rights of the citizen the vocabulary of the court also on the basis of the constitutional provision are always being right based vocabulary there needs to be a change in the vocabulary and the usage of the expression the interpretation as to how the constitutional provision can now be interpreted in a manner where there will be imposition of the state on the state an absolute and clear obligation on the first part of it relating to entitlement it uh, is primarily by the provisions that are made by the state by the government the provisions by the state will be by way of empowerment and secondly by way of provisioning the basic needs so far the provisioning of the basic needs are concerned parliament has passed taxes as per which the food security act as per which car individuals who are in need are identified obligations are created systems are created methodologies are provided these targeted individuals who are before, below the poverty line are given a right under the statute which needs to there is a need on the part of the state and there is also a correlative obligation on the part of the state to ensure that these provisions are there having passed the act and having worked on the act for over years it was realized that it is not sufficient it is not working efficiently and therefore an alternative methodology of uh, provisioning of empowering through money has been adopted these two together operate today as the statutory and the legal regime 
to ensure that that food reaches those who are below the poverty line and they can claim it as a matter of right where does the court come in there where does the right come in there and today if we are dealing with the power that will be vested in the hands of persons who are hungry the search must be for a provision of law or a right under the constitution where one could go to the court and ask for such a right the first phase the court recognized a negative right in the second phase the supreme court has tried to bridge the gap by saying there is also an obligation in the third phase which is to commence and perhaps commence a little bit is in enforcing this statute these are the statutes which grant a provision the basic need in the form of food in the statutory framework it also provides empowerment through direct transfer of wealth like any other statutes like labor laws and many other statutes they are on the books so the role of the court comes in in enforcing these and ensuring that the parliamentary promise to the citizen is carried out by the executive and therefore the right is a contemplated in the statutory provision must be carried forward that is the most essential part of it which perhaps the time will tell to what extent we all have contributed and the court has taken the next step the yet another the parallel issue which also which is also a matter of concern and which is also seminal for the present purposes moving away from what called a negative right and as we are saying a duty orientation there four or five principles will emerge where the court will have to ensure that the obligations are carried out new methods new systems new principles need to be evolved to ensure accountability it's not merely the rights that are declared it is not merely the obligations that are declared it is now the stage where once these are statutorily pronounced rights are created court will be entitled to enforce it and enforcement requires most importantly what may be called as accountability principle we we can stop here so far as the legal regime is concerned i will conclude by saying that there is yet another small aspect of it which we all need to reflect on civilizationally is it always a situation where it is just the obligation of a state to provide and for the court to enforce that obligation i think as a civilization so far as indian subcontinent is concerned it was not considered to be a state's obligation across the board individually in groups in communities in religious congregation this country had always witnessed a situation where it was part of to be an obligation of an individual as well as the society to ensure that there are no hungry persons that obligation i think must have a, a recognition and it's going to go a long way if these institutions are strengthened and these institutions are recognized and individuals are motivated groups are motivated religious congregations are motivated to ensure that this problem is resolved i have dealt with in a very limited and a practical
point of view. I have not dealt with the rights as enshrined in international law. I am sharing with you things which we can do as what uh, my friend Sanjay Parikh has done. What lawyers can do, what judges can do, what executives can do. So far as the executive is concerned, it has to implement the parliamentary mandate, laws are there. If the right to security or food security act is implemented, substantially it will be able to go. Courts have to implement it. Courts have to ensure that it is implemented. Accountability is brought in. So far as the future projection is concerned, how the life would be in years to come because of climate change is a very large issue. We need to definitely reflect upon it. It includes many things such as changing our eating habits, like for example moving away from enormous water consuming rice production to more healthier cereals and uh, millet. From changing the life structure, life balance, we need to move on to bring about large number of changes, not only to ensure that the people don't go hungry, but also ensure that we have a better life and better society and better world in times to come. I thank all of you for giving me an opportunity of speaking on this occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, your Lordship, for being so kind in accepting our invitation and taking out time to share with us your knowledge, thoughts and insights on the subject. Your Lordship, we look forward to your kind presence in future programs also. Thank you. Thank you once again. Now, I would like to hand over the podium to Dr. Shikha Ranjan, sir, Secretary General, Indian Society of International Law, to propose formal vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Kanika, for uh, giving me the podium. Namaskar and good evening to all, both of uh, both who are present in person here, I am personally grateful for your kind presence and hundreds of people have joined us online through YouTube and Facebook Watch. We are very grateful to all of them who, are join, who have joined us through the virtual world also. Uh, it is my proud privilege to propose a vote of formal vote of thanks on this uh, occasion. Honorable Master Justice uh, P.S. Sama. Uh, Vice President uh, Professor Manoj Sinha, Sri Sanjay Parikji, Professor B.G. Hegde, uh, Professor D.N. Johar, who has come all the way from Chandigarh to be with us on this uh, occasion, Professor Rashmi Sal Salpekar, Captain J.S. Gill, members from the bar, colleagues from the Legal and Teachers Division, students of Academy, and all the distinguished gathering, Dr. Meera Shiva is also with us, uh, all the life members, distinguished life members, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you all are here uh, uh, and very well know of the work which the Indian Society of International Law established way back in 1959 has been doing towards the promotion and dissemination of international law. The society is indeed indebted to its founding president D.K. Krishnamanian and its practices for nurturing it as an institution and that has led us to attain uh, the uh, being the premier national institution for international law teaching and research and dissemination in the country. Sir, let me first of all thank eminent uh, jurist uh, and the doyen of human rights movement, late Justice Rajinder Sachar, in whose memory we are meeting here. The, uh, the idea of organizing this lecture was conceived jointly with the family of Justice Sachar Madhvi ji and Sanjeev ji has joined us on the occasion and along with uh, Mr. Sanjay Parekh and the Executive Committee of ISIL decided to hold it uh, close to the Human Rights Day that is celebrated on 10th of December every year. So we are, it's our good fortune that we are here on uh, the 74th, on the eve of 74th anniversary of the uh, Human Rights Movement 
the adoption of human rights universal declaration of human rights and it's a fitting tribute to the memory of justice thatcher uh, that we are holding this lecture it is my pleasant duty first and foremost on behalf of the society to thank uh, honorable justice uh, ps narasimha rao narasimha sir for doing complete justice i will borrow the word of article 142 to the topic of right to food security he has come taken us completely from the theoretical perspective the uh, work of the honorable supreme court in three or two phases and wants it to be taken to the third phase so that the right is actually realized for the teeming millions who live in extreme conditions of poverty uh, sanjay ji's book coat and hunger that came to be released on this occasion uh, is uh, my predecessor uh, speaker have spoke eloquently about the book uh, as a matter of encouragement uh, for all of those who are present the publisher has put up a stall outside the uh, auditorium and is offering a generous discount of 20% so if anybody is interested please do purchase it sir has gifted copies to our library uh, so all of us all of you can read from there also but it, having a personal copy is always better uh, now uh, our president mr p h parik could not join us because of certain uh, family circumstances on his behalf and the members of the executive council of the society i convey to this august gathering uh, our sincere gratitude for joining us on this occasion i am equally thankful to professor v g hegde professor manoj kumar sena for taking out time from their busy schedule and making an address on this occasion uh, we are extremely grateful to the family of justice thatcher for joining us on this occasion further my colleagues in isil shri vinay singh dr anwar sadar dr parneet kaur dr kanika sharma dr minakshi sohan uh, and the support staff make sincere efforts in making these programs successful and well attended i profoundly thank them for their contribution i am equally grateful to my colleagues in the secretariat prachi bakshi ji santram ji ravinder ji sanjay kumar ji and other support staff for their efforts please do pardon us in case there are any shortcomings or failing in the organization of these uh, events and let me uh, request all of you to give a standing ovation to justice narsimha and the author of the book ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस प्रोग्राम थैंक यू वेरी मच